And we'll start with Lynn. Just identify yourself for the record. Lynn Mazzulli. Sandy Kuypers. Ryan Hogan. Dick Vandenberg. Heather Morn. Carol Gogolinski. So we have a quorum. Anybody on Zoom that we know of? Lynn, do you have that over? <clears throat> All right, so uh, you have the agenda. And our idea tonight is not to necessarily discuss everything on the uh, rough draft of the town warrant, but to go through some of the things that might need some more explanation or some uh, just get into the details a little bit more. So first of all, does anybody have any questions about any of the items on the draft of the town warrant for the special town meeting? Because we're not going to go through the whole thing tonight, but because uh, some of it we've talked about before. But just up front, does anybody have any? Well, should we wait till we get to each, each yeah. one? OK. So some of you have read it over, and perhaps I you have. You, OK. Yes. All right, so um, if you look on page, the first page, you see Article 1 has various transfers. And you'll notice at the bottom, uh, Gene has just some placeholders there. So Matt, can you speak to any of those numbers at this point? Or not, Matt? Well, Jack. Either the COA wages or the COA expenses. Any? We have a sense of what those numbers might be at this point yet, Matt, or not? I do. And are are they pretty hard and fast? Would you say, or might they change between now and November? Hard and fast as I'm going to get. Okay. This is one page. Okay. So if you don't mind me taking it from the top, okay. Since we're talking music tonight. <laughs> I don't book. Nice segue there. I'm good like that. <laughs> I get up early. Um, <clears throat> the select board entertained a proposal for a bus service for the adult social mm -hmm. center. So that has an impact on this warrant in a number of different places. So that's um, Article 6, right? Article 6. COA bus, yeah. So let's we'll see what we did here. Oh, we didn't put the number in. All right, so the number appears in the memo. <clears throat> uh, we have begun using a national blanket contract, which is approved by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for use by municipalities. And the entity is called Sourcewell. And the nice thing about Sourcewell <clears throat> is that they're national contracts, so you're not going to go buy a bus. You're going to hook onto a contract that's going to go out and buy 500 buses. And you benefit from the quantity pricing, from the delivery priority that you get working through a bigger buying group. So we've done a couple of things with Sourcewell already. We've bought a small pickup truck for the building official that was in the budget last year, approved by town meeting. And we've also <coughs> engaged them with a fuel card program mm so that we can make sure that all of the taxes that the town is exempt from are removed from what we pay at the pump for a gallon of gas. Because we don't have our own fuel depot. We're going to Family Convenience, we're going to Beck's. So those vendors have signed up with us to be part of the fuel card program. So now when we buy a gallon of diesel or gas, all of the taxes are removed. And that's a WEX. Um, WEX is the clearinghouse for payments, but it's a source well program. So we called source well today. They are a big player in the municipal vehicle market. And Patrice and I had a lengthy conversation with the rep about a bus that would meet her required specifications or her preferred specifications for a vehicle. Is source well municipal only then, pretty much? Uh, it's mostly that, municipalities, but some big states, like Minnesota, will buy through them. I see, OK. So a lot of times when you hear people buying buses, they'll say, I'm on the Minnesota contract. <laughs> that tends to be a very popular thing. Um, long story short, you know, when you put people who might need extra time on a bus, whether because they're in a wheelchair or a walker or whatnot, you need some space inside the bus to move around. So you can get an, a, a relatively affordable vehicle that's got one wheelchair position and a couple of seats in it, but that is not what 
Patrice would spec out for the town. We may have more than one person who needs a ride who's in a wheelchair, and some of these vehicles can be flexible. So the vehicle she has specced is a vehicle that has four wheelchair positions. Whenever you set up a wheelchair position, you're losing seats. All right, so you fold up the seats and you push them aside and you, and you secure the person in their wheelchair. So this would normally be a uh, 14 passenger bus. It's 14 feet long. Um, <clears throat> you lose about eight seats when you put all four wheelchairs in. So you'd have, still have room for a couple people to sit, but that's where you'd end up. Um, the tough thing about these buses is that all of the economic disturbance that we've been through over the past couple of years, and some of the chip, you know, the dashboards for these Ford vehicles with all the chips, computer chips in them, have gotten harder to get and more expensive. So a bus that would have cost about $75,000 two years ago is presently selling for 115000 So that is the best estimate we have. We will have a written quote by Friday, but we just had this verbal quote today. So that is the or that is Article Six. These two items here um, in Article One, so COA wages and COA expenses, are there to reflect the operating costs of such a bus were we to have it. So we went out and looked at several surrounding communities that operate their bus right now, and those rates that you see on item number two in the second numbered list. Those are the hourly rates for starting salaries for those employees in those towns. Um, effective July, uh, January 1st, that Northbridge rate can't stay there because that would be below the minimum wage. The minimum wage would be $15 an hour uh, starting January 1st, 2023. So I don't know that anybody actually makes this rate, but that is what they're, that is where they are on the scale so the average of the rates is about $16.91, let's call it close to $17. I would put the grade um, <clears throat> in the comp plan at miscellaneous grade one, which gives me 10 steps there, which mm -hmm. range from 1556 to 1901. And I would like the flexibility if I were to be appointing someone to those positions to put them on the scale according to their experience. Um, for budgeting purposes, I would take the highest rate. So 20 hours a week for 12 weeks, the remaining quarter of 2023, because it will take five to six months to get a bus if we, town meeting were to approve it. Mm -hmm. That's 240 hours in 1901, and the budget would be 4563. Now would that person be considered a full-time employee and get no. benefits? No, uh, regular part-time. So what we would do is split it into two pieces so that we were well below 20. Okay. So one person would 12 to 15 hours a week. The other would be per diem. The point of having two is that if one person gets sick, you're still gonna run the bus service. So you should have two people on the payroll. The per diem would step up and fill, mm -hmm. and, and vice versa. The but, bus is to transport people from the senior center. So on the next page of the memo okay. <laughs> is the mileage estimate. Miles don't cost money, fuel does, but we went through what Patrice would anticipate the bus would do. We would drive a fair amount locally here in Douglas. Getting people to the center is the primary purpose of having a bus service, right? Getting people to, for nutrition, for exercise, for social activity. But then we have some specific needs that the population has already brought up to us. We would probably run to Milford Hospital and its nearby buildings or buildings on campus uh, three times a week. It's about a 22 mile trip, round trip, each time. Um, <clears throat> the precise calculation of that is 813.6 miles would be anticipated over those 12 weeks of Q4 of the fiscal year. Uh, people would like to go to the grocery store one time a week. They would go to the big box retail in Northbridge one time a week. I'm not naming the businesses because that's not cool, but um, between those two businesses, that's where a majority of our seniors get their prescriptions filled. So there would be a dual purpose, not just going to shop. It would be to get their pharmaceuticals. Um, <clears throat> so then I just took all of that and said, you just double that 
to account for your local travel. So you're going to get about 1,992 miles estimated. This bus is pretty well known. Uh, platform, it's the E350 Ford platform, it gets about 12 miles to the gallon. So we'd use about 166 gallons at $4.50, because remember we don't pay all the taxes. You have a fuel budget of about, let's call it, what, 747 is the, the math. I'd call it 750 just to be kind of close to. So you can take that one quarter cost, multiply times four, and that would be the annualized cost for, that would go into the budget for fiscal 24 if this were to be approved. Now, do they pick people up at their homes? Yes. I think the general rule is you have to be ambulatory to get on the bus. If you are already in a wheelchair, that's a safer thing. But what we're not going to do, because we can't safely do it, is you know, having difficulty walking, you're better off just getting in the wheelchair and getting into the bus right. than trying to get on with a walker or a cane. Okay. It's much safer. Uh, we would want the driver to be CPR certified, mm -hmm. but this a bus of this size is below the CDL threshold, so we wouldn't be trying to recruit a, a CDL. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions for Matt on either COA wages or COA expenses? Anybody? I, I have a question on the bus proposal, I'm not sure. Not really on the wages. Has a survey been done? I mean, how do, do we anticipate the people are getting to these services now? Do we, has a survey gone out? Do we, how many do we anticipate will be using these services? There hasn't been a formal survey. A lot of what we do at our adult social center is personal interaction. Mm -hmm. Patrice is in here to go into it, so I don't feel comfortable speaking for her first-person perspective. Um, I don't know that we can assume that people are getting these services now. I think one of the reasons why it's being talked about is because they are either spacing out their trips to Milford or not going at all because they don't have a ride or they're getting a ride from a family member mm -hmm. causing any number of inconveniences to other people in their lives in order to be able to get there. This, so the number one request that drives this through the process is there is no public transit solution to get people from Douglas to Milford. You have both Blackstone and Millville down here. They have separate buses for each of their towns, or do they share one? Or you don't know? Oh, I know. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just laughing. Just, yes. You know, there are places where you shouldn't wear a Millville t-shirt. Blackstone might be one of them. <laughs> Just a, they, they have schools together, but they don't necessarily see eye to eye in a lot of things. And they're not necessarily close. If, if you know where Millville Town Hall and some of the other Millville resources are, they're not necessarily close to Blackstones. So, but that is, that is true. They, they each have a bus. The, the mighty, mighty town of Millville, which doesn't have a lot of things that we have, has a senior bus. I know when we had this many, many years ago, we used to share with another town. Would that I see Sutton's not on the list. Would we consider sharing with Sutton if usage was? And my big concern is I'm not sure how much this is going to be used. I think it's a great idea if it's going to be used often. I just want to make sure we're, we know there's going to get some use and have some maybe options if it, uh, you know, would that be a possibility to, you know, we share service, other share services with local towns. Could we share with Sutton or somebody else? Does yeah, I'll do my best to answer your questions. I, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make it clear that I'm not advocating yay or nay on any of these proposals that come through the select board for ARPA. My job is just to document as best I can the, okay. the, the thought process. But we talk about shared resources at the municipal level for many, many things. And my favorite example is street sweeping, right? What a pain in the neck it is to have a street sweeper in your fleet because you only use it so many times. They wear out because if, if it's a vac unit, it's going to sandblast itself. And then it's really difficult to find somebody who you can either rent from or hire them to come street sweep. It's much higher cost per annual sweeping. 
But then when you talk to your regional partners and say, hey, you know, we share an air, animal control officer, we share this, we share. well, the problem is we all need the asset at the same time. So even though it's a pain in the neck to have your own, sharing it's an even bigger pain in the neck because you don't have it when you need it. And I think that's some of what goes on here is that while we're all small towns and we may all have similar needs, land-wise, landmass-wise, the smaller towns are pretty big and so people are pretty far apart. The bigger towns fill their buses. So Northbridge and Oxbridge run multiple units and they're busy. They have, I'm sorry, they have multiple buses? I think Oxbridge has the two or three. Okay. Well, the town I'm in is only the size of Uxbridge, and we have six. We have a very elderly population in Westport, but there's a lot of people that use the service. <clears throat> you know, I agree with you that that would probably be between now and town meeting, something that Patrice and others need to document better, okay. which is how many people do you have that think we're the users. Um, <clears throat> Since COVID, we've had really solid participation at the, the social center because there's a lot of, we learned a lot of things about how to do things better mm -hmm. because we had to try to manage it without being in person. So it was a pretty decent clientele. The other thing that I find a little bit interesting is I know there are people from these other towns that come to our social center because they like it better. <laughs> right, so, you know, it, it, you wish you could do regional stuff, but it ends up being a little bit harder than people realize. Do we have an estimate on the life of the of this van would be? I really don't. Um, they're not as hardy or as as strong as other trucks, right? It's an E350, which I, I it's not the greatest platform in the world, right? So you're looking at if we take care of it and we're able to put it under cover and regularly maintain it, you know, what did I say for annual miles? It's about 8,000 miles a year. You should get 10, 12 years out of this. Where are you going to put on the boat? Well, that's... <laughs> I didn't say where, I said if. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's all I got. That, anybody else questions for Matt on the Council of Aging stuff? Matt, while we have you here, uh, Anything else on the, the draft of the warrant you want to just speak to? With I can jump up and down as you need me. Okay, we'll just go in order then and we'll, we'll grab you as we need you then. Looking ahead, I will stay here for two, three. Okay. In case anybody has questions about two. Right. Three. Anybody else on the Article 1 items? The numbers are there except for the two placeholders and Matt provided those for us. Jean, is there anything you want to say about Article 1? Uh, not unless you have any specific questions. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on that? A lot of these are just, I don't know if routine is the right word, but it's to tie up some loose ends that we weren't able to do back in the spring. The only thing I would uh, stay is Norfolk Agricultural was because it was an additional student after the budget. I think that's the uh, the biggest surprise. Tree warden is routine. So we do yeah. this every year. We we try to see what comes in for money during the year and try to up the tree warden's efforts if there's available money. Okay, we're ready to move on to Article 2, everybody? Mm -hmm. All right, so any comments or questions on Article 2 of the warrant? You want to speak to that, Matt, or not? No, in the interest of time, if there's no questions, I'll okay. let it go. This has been discussed quite a bit. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. it has been. Okay. Everybody go to the Article 2? Mm -hmm. Good. Article 3 on the oil spill. Anything new on that, Matt? Oh, there's the plenty. Plane. How long do you want to sit here and talk about this? Uh, not too long. <laughs> is the end in sight here? Yes, the end is in sight. Okay. So the new is there a light at the end of the tunnel or not? There is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's about $65,000 away, which is okay. why we're asking town meeting for a little bit extra money to, f to close this out. Uh, long story short, uh, we changed consultants because the other one ran for the hills when we said we were going to do a peer review. He resigned six minutes after I sent him the email saying we would do a peer review of his work. 
the new consultant has a, just a different approach, has interpreted the data in a much more, frankly, standard way, and is going to try to remove this incident from Tier 1 so we'll get out of the DEP monitoring and just go to closure. Uh, we got a couple of small mop-up items that do need to be closed. Uh, we got a little bit of soil gas readings underneath the boiler pad that just because they were detected, they have to be addressed. So that's basically where we are. So we're, <clears throat> we're not going to be doing a sub-slab, you know, <clears throat> gas evacuation unit. So <clears throat> if you have radar in your house, I did when I was in Rhode Island, you had a little fan that ran constantly. Mm -hmm. So we're not doing that. So we're, we're taking like 50 some odd thousand dollars out of the closure budget. Um, <clears throat> the groundwater came back with nothing in it. We are just going to redig the wells because they were improperly done outside the building. Oh, really? Yeah, they were just in hmm. a totally wrong location. So those things will be addressed, and that's what the sixty-five thousand is for. <clears throat> if you heard me say it to the select board, I am going to pursue some dialogue with our property and casualty insurer around the performance of their environmental consultant because. This starts off as an insurance claim. So the first half million comes from our insurer. What we've spent above and beyond that half million is what we're asking town meeting to, to finish mm -hmm. funding. Yeah. So the claim as a whole is going to push $700,000 total. And you know it was all driven by analysis that was a little bit too gung-ho. And mm. this could have been closed out for a lot less money. So is it the insurance that, company that brings in the consultant? Yeah, it's their liability, so they hire the consultant. They hire them. Gene, how does this affect our free cash of sixty-five thousand? But once uh, I should, I'm hoping to have free cash certified by your next meeting. I just submitted my reports to Department of Revenue, so we will have free cash as an available funding source. But I'm not prepared to state the number. Of the amount of free cash yet. And I wouldn't want you to either. Thank you. <laughs> All right, any questions for Matt on the Article 3, anybody? Now, I'm risk accepting, but I still don't want to tell you what. So there you go, it's okay. that preliminary. He would be out of the circle of trust. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you say so. All right, everybody good with Article 3? All right, Article 4, comments or questions? What? Is the water department going to talk about that, or what's, what's well, the time they expect them to? Yes. Hmm. Would you like them at your next meeting? It'd be kind of nice to know what we're spending two hundred thousand on. Yeah. Yes, please. So that would be our. Uh, it, but I'm just curious. <laughs> so it's the, it's right there for a lead service inventory and replacement program. Needs to be replaced by October twenty twenty four. Okay. Basically, Massachusetts Claim Water Trust is telling you you have to do it. Oh, okay. You want them to come in, Carol? Not really. If it's okay. something that has to be done, oh, they'll be coming up with more stuff too. I, I'd like them to come in. If we're gonna spend two hundred thousand, I'd like to hear a little bit about it. Uh, Who's phone? Is that? Can we get them for our October? I'll, be, I'll ask okay. Bob Sullivan if he can join us. Thank you. All right. So Article Four, Water Department people might. Be able to come to our next meeting, we can ask them more detail on that. Yeah, I think what we want them to explain is some of the verbiage here at the end. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, because there could be some borrowing, but the borrowing could be through a 100% loan forgiveness loan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this might just be we the typical, we, we, right, we raise the flag, say here's your 200,000, they give us the loan, then they forgive the loan. I know that sounds crazy, but that's how some of these programs are. Do a mass save loan. You front the money and then they pay you back 12 months later. Yeah. Okay, everybody good on Article 4? All right, Article 5. Any comments or questions, anybody? I, I do. Yeah, what is it? So Article 5, there's a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of words there. <clears throat> but... The select board has granted, as part of the closing on the property over next to McIntyre's pit mm -hmm. for the warehouse, a license 
to allow the driveway construction, to bring in the construction equipment, mm -hmm. partial encroachment onto the town's property mm -hmm. for sloping. Just You can't just put the driveway up with a cliff off the side. You're going to grade it out so the trucks can move along and the weight would be distributed across the graded surface. The driveway itself is on property they own. Mm -hmm. But the sloping used to support the driveway will encroach on town land. The select board doesn't have the legal authority to grant an easement. Okay. That's an interest in real property. That has to be done by town meeting. So the, the proposal before town meeting is to convert that license into an easement permanently to run with the land. So they're going to be adding gravel in to make this easement. They're not taking gravel out. Correct. Okay. Because if they were taking gravel out, no, we would want the money. money for it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I see where you're coming from, Carol. No, that is not the case. They're going to be building up yeah, on the surface. They will, not be, they will not be taking any any from it. They're going to add to it. Yeah. Okay. So the, the latest conversation is that these, the concrete panels will not be poured in place. They will be shipped in. So there'll be some heavy truck traffic rumbling through for a couple months while the building is built. Okay. Any idea when, if, if this is all approved at the town meeting, when stuff will happen is it oh there's stuff happening now okay uh, there's site work going on so the really big huge excavator really big huge front load front end loader some other uh, site prep ma machinery so if we it's drove already by there, in place see, and working you see you should you would see clouds of dust okay because you're looking downhill so you wouldn't see too too much from the bottom of the hill but you'll see the activity from the dust uh, <clears throat> The critical step is the installation of the bridge over the Mumford. So there's rival technological solutions to that problem, engineering solutions. That's where we really want the traffic to go for construction. Mm -hmm. We have to build the bridge first. It needs time to sit, cure. And when will that happen, you think? Fall, winter. Okay. Oh, I believe year? the people who say they're building the building I don't listen to the engineers because at the end of the day, the people who hold the purse strings are the ones who are going to determine the schedule. Right. And the last thing I heard out of Frank Bakunas' mouth from CRG is, we want this building open in 10 months. So, so I'm listening to him. Downstream. He's writing the, the checks. From the uh, little bridge, from the little dam there, right? Okay. Yeah, just downstream a little bit. All right, anybody else on Article 5? Welcome, Howard. And Mike, too. <laughs> Glad you guys can make it. All right, uh, let's go to Article 6 then. Map and Knight, don't worry, we're going to get to you. Oh, he can have the floor. <laughs> Look at all these pages he's got here. All right, I think we're. Do we need to do Article 6? We need to no. We're going to talk yeah. about 6 and 7. And 7, all right. Article 8, Matt, any comments on that or any questions, anybody on South Street? I will help everybody see the travel here. South Street is one of our top priorities for pavement. Uh, it's, it carries a lot of traffic, it carries school buses, it's in really tough shape, especially certain sections of it that haven't been paved in a really long time. Uh, <clears throat> but we also have a mountain of drainage problems with the road. And we really need to engineer the drainage solutions, so why spend a lot of money repaving a road only to have it chewed up with water and ice because you didn't engineer the drainage properly. So we that is the proposal is to raise this forty five thousand dollars to hire an engineer to do the drainage improvement design, install the those drainage improvements and then do the pavement after that. So we postponed South Street for one year in order to be able to there are many culverts that cross the road, and there's a lot of water that comes off. What would that be? The west side of the road. Okay, any questions or comments? All right, let's carry on to... Uh, I can happily excuse myself at this point. Matt, are you going to talk about Article 9? Yes, sir. Matt Benoit? Sure. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, members of the FinCom. Good evening. Uh, the Route 16 sidewalk project started long before I did. Uh, this. Uh, you mean before you were born? <laughs> <laughs> um, two years removed oh. from college. Does that help? <laughs> um, so. Uh, there was a, there was a vote at a at a previous town meeting to uh, at least start exploring this project, and I'm I'm not so keen on the entire history of it, but ultimately we have uh, had our engineering team look at this uh, section of sidewalk. This is an extension of the sidewalk on Route 16 up the hill, kind of near was that Franklin Street Sunset. You guys know the town better than I do. I'm still getting there. So that's about 800 foot section of sidewalk. Now, what this ended up turning into was a was a massive stormwater project. Uh, there are four catch basins, three manholes, uh, a lot of drainage and curbing that needs to be done, ADA compliance on the sidewalk, et cetera. And this, this project ballooned in cost substantially than what we would have originally anticipated back in 2008 with the capital plan. Uh, so, but the due diligence is to see the project through to, to get the, the article onto the warrant as it was requested by the residents of, of the community back back then. So this is the estimate that we've come come up with and uh, it's presented before you this evening. And will this hit everything on the checklist in terms of many ADA, drainage, yes. et cetera, et cetera. It is a it is a substantial checklist <laughs> and includes and this is only one estimate with a thirty percent contingency because we anticipate that the work wouldn't be done right away. Still have to get multiple quotes, etc. So, uh, so how many feet of sidewalk is that going to give us? John, say like seven or eight hundred feet. Yeah. Does it end at Franklin Street? Is that one of the ends of it? It ends at. Is it Sunset? sunset. Yes. Across sunset. The, across from the GBI. Yes. Oh. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. The crosswalk would uh, cross Franklin Street and extend onto the other side uh, for a short duration, a couple hundred feet. So if the town meeting approves this, mm -hmm. how soon would the work start? I don't have an answer for that. Okay. <laughs> All right, any questions on this, uh, anybody? I do. How much do we approve in 2008 for the project? It, I wish I had that number, but it was definitely not this high. Um, it's below 60 in the right. 50s. Mm -hmm. It's like 50,000 or something. Yeah, I'm thinking 55, and that's unusual for me to just throw out a number, but sure it was it's... below 60. Okay. And that hasn't been spent yet, or that has they been spent? They have started to spend it. Um, They've started to spend it. Yes. On this. Yeah. On the production. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. On the production of this this estimate, yes. Okay. So Thank you. So it's the 383 over and above that? It's 30% over the estimate, which was 294 and okay. 578. All right, any comments or questions, anybody, for Matt? Was the, the 290 something estimate that mm -hmm. was what originally, when we were originally doing it? No, this is what came forward now uh, from Stantec. And then they added a 30% contingency because we don't know when the work would begin. So. Okay. But the original thing was like 60,000, right? Right. I don't know what the, you know, it was part of the capital uh, article. I don't know if it meant to do the whole thing, if it was meant to just do the engineering portion. I mean, it was, it was many years ago. A couple of unanticipated expenses arose, and one of them was to have a camera into the system to see what infrastructure is already under the road, and that was about 7,500, I believe. And, and we've been working with the residents also that are, have been lobbying for the sidewalk. We called them into meetings to review the design also, and they're very satisfied with what what they see to this point. So. Um, most of that, I believe, is around fifty-seven, fifty-eight thousand, is will, will be expended due to the the work that they've already done for us with the design. Okay. Anybody else comments or questions? Yeah, bear with me. Okay, Howard. Um, so did this come back up on this year's short list of capital improvement items that they thought were ready to rise to the top? So. No. No. What's it doing here? So it, the project is requested by residents. The it, you got to go out there and kind of look at it because it's very hard to explain why this got complicated. I think it was originally conceived 
that Mr. Cundiff asked for the money because he viewed it as probably just a pour in place, just going to pour concrete sidewalk and to satisfy the residents, and it'll all work out. But investigation of the site, if, you, if you're familiar with this little section of Main Road, there are two double catch basins, yes. right? On a steep incline, they handle a tremendous amount of water. It's not safe to walk, right? Little children or others who might be walked by these big double catch basins. So in order to make a sidewalk that is safe on a busy road, required additional engineering. Because residents have been very vocal in asking for it, pursuing the project, the money that was already approved went to design the project. <clears throat> Whether it's now or sometime in the future, they have an understanding now of what it will cost. But sometimes town meeting is a vehicle for people who have asked for something to get a vote, yay or nay. It's a perfectly acceptable um, method of dealing with public expectations. So that's why we're, we're here with this. Matt, who is the constituency? Who does it connect to downtown? The two streets? Yeah, the younger left. families living along the side of the street. Sunset, it brings people, the Sunset Group connected now? Mm -hmm. It would connect them to downtown, downtown Main Street. Yeah, because right now the sidewalk goes past West Street, probably about halfway between West Street and Franklin Street. Mm -hmm. It ends at the Dead first end. big skeleton. Yeah, and then it, it yeah, exactly. Well exactly. done. Yeah. And then does it go up? Is there a sidewalk up Franklin? No, there's no sidewalk so up Franklin. It doesn't help per se that event. Sunset probably has a sidewalk or it's at least a different kind of a road. It does. Okay. Sunset comes to Maine, I believe, on one side of the road with a sidewalk. Franklin yeah. has nothing, but Side. I think this project includes bringing the sidewalk around the property on the floor. Two sunset. I would believe right. so. Yes. So the primary constituency is sunset, because mm -hmm. Franklin didn't. That, I guess they can get to the bottom of the road, and now they're connected. If you they can get safely to the bottom of the road. Yeah, I mean you're walking in the street. Road. You're walking in the street yeah. down no, that hill, no. past the catch basin. Yeah. You know, that's open. Okay. So. And on a $50,000 request 14 years ago, with a regular cost of inflation, that request could be 100. But because of the added events, it's closer to 400. Thank you. Thank you. Also, okay. Thank you. Anybody else comments or questions on that article? How much are we spend on the roads this year? Just out of curiosity. In total, I know that sounds kind of out of the box, but I don't know what we got for chapter 90. We're paving right now, so you'll see everybody around this next two weeks or so because we've started and we'll finish before November. About three quarters of a million. So, town meeting matched our chapter 90, so that brought us about 720. But then we got another program. I'm going to forget the acronym. It's wrap, something like that, uh, which was additional money. So call it for the sake of argument, close to nine hundred thousand. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Let's go to the next article. Amend zoning bylaw section ten definitions. So Matt Benoit. Yes, sir. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, the committee may uh, find this to be familiar. Uh, at a previous town meeting, we um, introduced uh, a lengthier version of this that included some diagrams and some uh, some more description under elevation. And by the time it went to the uh, planning board for public hearing, it got broken down into this one sentence you see here today. Um, when it went to the town meeting floor, um, the moderator didn't want to accept the changes, so ultimately it got postponed, so we're, we're back to pitch what the planning board agreed on uh, with the language, which is the one sentence to define height. And that height uh, is the language that preferred by the building commissioner who will be enforcing height. This is no different than last May, right? It's just the timing is the issue. It's right? just simplified, yes. Okay. Yes. Any questions on that, anybody? The only question I have, is there any thought of raising the height restriction from that mm -hmm. 35 feet? 
hasn't been discussed. It's something I've always been a fan of. Yeah. <laughs> if you're looking at development. Well, so, this is the thing. You yeah. get the, the taller the house, the more expensive it is, and the more taxes we get off of them. Mm -hmm. So if they want to come in and build a few little mansions, <laughs> come on in. We'll take your money. <laughs> Especially since usually by the time they have enough money to build a house like that, they don't have any kids in the school or anything else. So it's usually just a cash cow. I think it should be looked into raising that height. I think the fire department has no problem with it because I know they've talked about how high the tall lattice that they have. Anybody else on Article 10? Okay, let's go to Article 11. Solar bylaw. <laughs> Matt, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, many pages of the solar bylaw yeah. takes up a majority of the special town meeting warrant. Um, similar story. Uh, there were some changes recommended by the planning board at a public hearing that took place two days after FinCom met, and so those changes were brought to the town meeting just slightly late, so they were not. A, it was uh, postponed again. So what I have done is I have incorporated those those three changes. Um, I incorporated an additional change for a request of some residents and it was also talked about with the planning board was to um, remove some language in here that um, recently had been overturned in some cases. Uh, it was uh, to use what's called a biomap uh, as a guide to uh, restrict development inside what's called core habitat areas, but the biomap was proved to be uh, just informative and not something that towns could use to regulate the use. So that was the, the fourth thing I removed from the bylaw, uh, given the case law. So uh, happy to answer any questions that the, that the committee may have. So Matt, between last spring and this, mm -hmm. like over the summer, mm -hmm. were there some major uh, tweaks or revisions from what you guys had in May, or is it pretty much? No, just the one that I that just mentioned okay. with the biomap. But what were the things? Kind of tell us what the things were. Yeah, uh, one of them was just a repetitive sentence. I forget which section it was in, but it was at the recommendation of the chairperson of the planning board at the public meeting back in April. Um, it was kind of a repetitive sentence. The other one was to change the table under section 6.8.9.1 for dimensional regulations. They adjusted the frontages, the minimum lot area, and the side and front setbacks. Those originally were 200 feet frontage, and I believe the side and rear setbacks were 100 feet apiece. So they reduced those. And then there was a. Yes, <laughs> that's the one I'm trying to find. Uh, it was land clearing and. Well, it's no longer a section number because it was removed, but ultimately there was a limit on the amount of forestry that you could clear, and the planning board uh, voted to remove the, the cap for clearing so that solar could could develop without restriction. So that was removed. So Matt, generally speaking, um, when you think back to the very early days of solar, mm -hmm. when the idea of these big solar arrays in fields not really on anybody's radar screen. It was you had mm -hmm. solar on your roof. Right. Um, but now we have these possibilities of these fields and fields of, of solar panels. Mm -hmm. Do you think the updated lingo is is keeping pace with the way the solar industry is changing? I mean, I d I do. I, are, are we keeping up with the time, so to speak? I think it's it's an, it's difficult to do because solar is under the Dover Amendment. It has a lot of exemptions under zoning, and as as projects get challenged throughout the Commonwealth, there's going to be opportunities where some of that language in their draft templates that we're pulling from may change. Uh, but what we can do is just. In this case, was kind of keep our ear to the track and follow the cases. I have some colleagues that uh, follow this stuff very well. So I was leaning on them a little bit for what some of the changes were so that we incorporated in it today. So things will change as, as it goes. Uh, other cases could, could change language in our bylaws and at the, those times we'll make the changes also. But um, we continue to watch it, but it, it's kind of difficult to answer. <laughs> are we, um, with the wording here, are we more or less consistent with our neighboring towns who are very struggling with the same thing? Uh, well, 
Well, it's one of the good things with Douglas is we're not restricting this to just certain areas of town. You know, we're very welcoming to solar already, just the way our bylaws are. And we're not changing uh, what zones they can be in or not be in. We're just adding language to govern, you know, monitoring, maintenance, uh, reporting, uh, clearing, design standards, lighting, fencing, and just those, those site plan aspects. And I know it's 13 pages of that, but it's consistent with the template that many towns in the Commonwealth have adopted. Okay, comments or questions, anybody? Article 13, or 11, I mean. Okay, if you go to page 12 of your handout, we come to Article 12. So Matt, I think you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Chairman, these last two articles kind of run at 10. 12 and 13? Yes. Okay. So, Earth removal currently exists as a zoning bylaw under section 6.1. Um, due to some, uh, so call it confusion between developers and the town, um, we uncovered a couple of gray areas in the earth removal bylaw that we needed to modify. And <clears throat> through conversation with the building commissioner and, and other members of the, of the community, um, the big thing we wanted to do was increase the cubic yard threshold that triggers the need for an earth removal permit. And right. It, Currently, it sits at 300 cubic yards. Now, anyone who builds a house that has a septic, that has a pool or anything, is going to trip. Is going to trip that. All right. So, what the building commissioner wanted to do was raise that to 1,000 cubic yards. So that was our main goal coming in. It's like we want the earth removal to really affect the larger projects in town. You know, not have an uh, independent homeowner have to come in and do things like this. So, <clears throat> that happened a lot. I mean. Uh, under the current bylaw, did it had been happening with a lot of subdivisions. Okay. So, it, but uh, it's consistent. Obviously, we have gravel pits that change their operation a lot, so they tend to apply for them more often than others. Uh, so, when I submitted originally just an amendment to the zoning bylaw under section 6.1, I submitted it to town council, and town council gave us the idea that this would um, this would be better served as a general bylaw for a couple of reasons, and okay. one of the reasons that they said was. That uh, currently there's a, you know, if it's a general bylaw, you don't have to worry about grandfathering for fill operations or, in some cases, agricultural exemptions. Where I'm sure many of you are familiar with an issue that took place in Uxbridge, where a developer was using large amounts of contaminated fill on a property and ended up in court and a bunch of things. So in this case, kind of learning from someone else's mistake. So. Um, so we took their recommendation and instead crafted this into a general bylaw and we presented it to the Board of Selectmen because the general bylaws administered them, by them, excuse me. Um, we have them as the permit granting authority and we gave the selectmen the opportunity to decide, do you want it to be you, do you want it to remain the planning board and it's staying under, it's going to, going to be a selectmen permit moving forward uh, per their request. So. That's what we have here. A lot of what's transferred into the general bylaw is already here. It's already in the zoning. It's just moving from one place to the next. But we really tuned out the, the exemptions piece and made sure that it it's very clear that it's it's either a thousand cubic yards or it's not. There's no exemptions for like septic or this uh, a certain pool or if it's incidental construction. We got rid of that. So it's just you're either a thousand cubic yards or not. We made it very cut and dry make it easy for everyone to interpret without any confusion moving forward. Matt, was there much discussion at the selectmen having this be a general bylaw? No. It just seemed like a good idea to everybody? Well, it, it's recommended by council. Yeah. <clears throat> just a, you know, our recommendation internally is the select board already regulates businesses in town. They are the licensing authority for businesses that serve alcohol or food and cannabis. So this is another type of activity that is not permitted unless there's a specific permit requested. But your terms and conditions are a lot like what the select board regulates. So time of oper hours of operation, days of operation, and it's a place where 
there can be some advocacy by the business or by neighbors around those items. I personally am never comfortable with the planning board making those determinations because I don't think that's what people think they're voting on when they vote for the planning board. They're voting for subdivision regulation implementation, <clears throat> maybe some of the special permits made available under the zoning code. When it comes to the regulation of a business, um, under almost like a licensing format, the, the select board can put that on the agenda at any time and deal with it. Uh, and that's that was our thought process making it a general bylaw. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions? Anybody? Oh, I have a few. Go ahead, Carol. <laughs> okay, first off, what areas did they think needed to be modified? The so town council. Um, with it, you had it with businesses. You had some problems with some businesses. Right. What, what, what ones were they? Uh, how do, would you like me to answer that, sir? Huh. Okay. Actually, not, not sure I heard the whole question. Okay. So what we had was we had a subdivision uh, in town that um, was taking a large amount of fill off of a site that spanned multiple lots. And the way that our regulation is read made it very gray to understand what was incidental to the construction of a house. Now, um, that could be the foundation, the septic, or whatnot. And in this particular project, it was grading a hill in the backyard. No, there's nothing in the regulation that read that that's not incidental to construction, or it is or it is not. So that led to some back and forth, and eventually um, an approval from the planning board, but it, it delayed a project substantially. Uh, just trying to come to an understanding about that. And ultimately, neither parties really agreed, but a permit was issued. So in order to avoid that moving forward with any other large scale subdivision projects, that's why we felt we needed to make a change. So we weren't sure what the change was going to be. We were just wanted to clean up that gray area in the zoning bylaw at the time. And it ended up morphing into a larger thing when we sent it off to council. And I said, move it to general. So, How does so this we would affect people who already have gravel permits and have pre existing non conforming uses? They would remain that way. They would remain yeah. pre existing non conforming use? Of course, unless they needed to propose some sort of massive change to their operation. So they're still allowed to remove their gravel. They're still going to be because if you what's zoning? Zoning, zoning is 40A. Mm -hmm. You do you uh, bring in this on Chapter 40, right? Mm -hmm. Or 41. This becomes yeah uh, general. So I forget what uh, section that is. I don't think it's 41. But I'm going to be asking that question at the town meeting. So, sure. So that's on record that people who already are pre-existing non-conforming use are not mm -hmm. affected by this bylaw. Yeah. And I believe that's true through the chair. And, because I and, don't think that they should be. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I, and in any use, uh, someone who owns a body shop in a certain district and he changes zoning on it, that shop's going to be allowed to continue you know, as a pre-existing non-conforming. So anything that already exists wouldn't be affected by the change unless they submitted an application or were required to because of a massive change to something. So. Yeah, I think that's the general idea, Carol, is yeah. if you keep it the way it had been, you're you're good to go, but if you are going to make a big change, then the newer thing would probably kick in. I would I would like the town council to actually address that okay. at the meeting. I want that on record. Okay. What specifically, Carol? Well, I'm uh, thinking about pine. There are pre-existing non-conforming yeah. use, and I know that because I'm the one that went to that brought that to court. Well, I was brought to court, okay, by the town, and it was determined that it was a pre-existing non-conforming use. The, they were told that they were not to interfere with our operations whatsoever, and um, and that and the non-conforming use goes with the land, not with the owners. So that non-conforming use continues on with pine or whoever owns pine at this time. Hmm. So what specifically would you like the town council want, to address I want, then? I want to, this, they are still going to be pre-existing non-conforming and can continue to run their business exactly as they do now. Okay. Well, a more general question. Anyone like that? Or anyone, anyone like that, right. Situated. Something that is a pre-existing non-conforming use. Hmm. Uh, uh, it's a stay of pre-existing non-conforming use. Yeah. I could provide an example. Um, we just permitted a, a gravel pit off of the new industrial subdivision off Davis Street. That's okay. where McIntyre moved to, right. to allow for the warehouse. Uh, his permit is issued, his permit is granted. 
this wouldn't change any of that. They had a permit. Yeah. We didn't have a permit. No. We didn't need a permit. That's what you're saying. And we never got a permit. That's what you're saying. <laughs> okay. Right. No, but I, I believe, and I could be wrong, obviously you were there, right. if not, but I believe you won that case. <laughs> oh, yes, we Yes. Did. <laughs> so. But and, we kind of yeah. lost it a little way because then we were told that we, that uh, Selectman told Buck Terry never to hire our equipment to do any work in town again. But then I didn't. Until the blizzard of 78. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but yeah, it is my understanding, but I, I think it's fair to, through you, Mr. Chairman, to, to ask that question, and I, okay. I'll, I'll gladly do that. Okay, anybody else on that article? Now, this, does this just entail, like, quote-unquote, removal? So, in other words, if I own property A, mm -hmm. I can't take it and put it over on property B, but could somebody who's operating or constructing a subdivision remove dirt for a foundation here and fill in a low spot over there of a thousand yards or more and still because it's on the same contingent owned property yes that's still allowable yes okay so, as long, so long as it's common ownership yes yeah and, con and contiguous yes yes yeah. okay anybody else on that article uh, one quick one was the planning board supportive of moving it from a zoning bylaw to a general bylaw? Their hearing is on Thursday. Okay. <laughs> and you'll be attending that, right, Ryan? I might watch. I don't think I'm going to attend. <laughs> Are we ready to move to Article 13, everybody? Matt, you have the floor. 13 is essentially the same conversation. It's right. just right. 12 yeah. is the removal of the zoning, yeah. and 13 is the acceptance of the general. Yeah. Mm. Matt Wojcik, do you have any insight on these issues of Article 12 and Article 13 that are on the warrant? No, just to remind people of the quantum of vote, though. So to take the zoning code provision out requires the two thirds. The general bylaw requires the majority. Right. So what happens if the first one doesn't put pass? Then the, the Article 13 would be moved. Okay. You have to pass. You should pass okay. it over. It. Yeah. Yes. So no comments or questions on Article 13? That's okay. why they're not in the opposite order. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of thought went into this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Matt Wojcik, do you have anything else for us of uh, note in terms of what's going on in town with money and what we should be concerned about? I do. I want to be quick. Before we do that, can I ask one question about the flyer? Is it possible to just send like the first one each? A few pages in our articles 11, 12, and 13 direct people to the web, uh, website, our town website or something, so we don't have to spend the printing cost to print the last. I don't know, it? It's good reading, though, right? Well, it's going to cost a lot of money in the last, you know, four or five pages. Can we say the bylaw is being changed? Please go here if you're interested. No? Council's opinion to tell you whether you can do that or not would cost more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Okay. He's that, a that's flat fee guy. Leave him alone. That every town does this, actually right. does a printout of the and mails to the houses, but I think it's such a great thing that we do it. Just it notifies town meetings. We, we, take some, we have a low yeah. turnout to begin with, so anytime we yeah. can get somebody through the door. Yeah. Take one and pass. Is this what we're looking at now, Matt? Yes. Okay. Do we have an estimate of how much it's going to cost to send this flyer out? Well, you have the mailing uh, estimate there. Box. That does not include the printing cost. Oh, that doesn't come. That's the mailing. Yeah. The, the printing's happens. like two. Pounds. I have. Well, well, it depends on the length. Yeah, of usually it's two. Oh, the one. Do they have one on that side? I think it went around that way. Oh, okay. So it right. doesn't sound like anyone's interested besides me, but I just just thought to save on the printing to. There's something many people in town are not going to go through, go through and read. But. Well, I'm so cheap. I got it on the email. I wouldn't print it out. So. Well, it's 28 pages. I'm not printing it. <laughs> You have the floor, Mr. Wojcik. Um, I just want to make sure everybody's tracking with me as we look at the budget for the year we're in and the year approaching. <clears throat> so we always start with revenue. The conversation starts with what resources are available to the town for the next coming year. One item that is not on this memo because it was sort of a late break today, 
is I think everyone is aware of um, the concept of new growth, right? A couple of nods, okay. So <clears throat> we had put into the budget for this year that we're in $400,000. And as the year went along, it looked like we might be a little short on that. But something has happened in town. The power company has been upgrading its lines for solar fields and putting three-phase power to different parts of town and upgrading both the wires and the poles. <clears throat> That's the so-called 504 account, which is the utility infrastructure. So, so much of it has been built and it is quite, has quite a high value that we actually look like we're going to be over $400,000. So the dynamic of this is the principal assessor comes up with his estimate for new growth. It is sent to DLS, there's conversations, various rules are applied. So that outcome is when your new growth is certified, right, after they approve it. I can only tell you what we've submitted. We've submitted 466514. So that's a a big number for new growth for a town like Douglas. So the total, and I went in my office specifically. Matt, is that on this paper somewhere? No, I just said oh. it's not on the memo. Oh, okay. Because it was a late breaking item. So I talked to the assessor today. But just for understanding the scope of it, we budgeted the levy to increase. So property and personal tax to go up 441352. So if we have if we do get certified with this number, and like I say, there could be pushback from DLS, but we have submitted 466514, which means we have more new growth than the year-over-year -year change in the levy. Based on what I have in my budget workbook, that did happen in 2020, but it didn't happen for many years before that. So it's a highly unique situation and I always want to remind people that this cannot and will not continue forever and ever. We are heading into an economic climate where the Fed is adjusting interest rates to calm inflation. Interest rates go up, real estate activity can often slow down, you don't get as many new homes built, you have more permits for remodeling and additions, but if the interest rates get too aggressive that even that will get tamped down. So <clears throat> this is a unique moment in time for a time like, like Douglas to have uh, three or four years and within that three or four year time frame to have two years where new growth has outstripped the growth of the levy. So it's a luxury, not a routine. Um, <clears throat> and that goes into our planning, both for the next fiscal year and for future fiscal years. Um, again, our situation will be different because we haven't even begun to receive the new growth or the revenues from the warehouse project. Now we broke ground on it, so I think we can finally say, you know, <laughs> yeah, obviously we want to see trucks driving in and out of there and people operating out of the business. But it's really not a theoretical concept anymore. People are dropping millions of dollars on this thing to get it built. So <clears throat> even if the residential home market does cool off or even go into stasis, Douglas will march ahead because economic development will keep you going through that period of time. It's a big number, but again, we'll bring that number in when it's time. Uh, the rest of what I have here, I, want to, I will get to the first bullet point at the end. What I wanted to do in the second and third bullet points is talk about adjustments we've made to revenue for the year we're in. The final budget that was passed by the General Assembly and signed by the Governor included a number of increases to various categories of municipal aid. So our budget estimates were conservative. The actuals that came in were higher than our conservative estimates. So there are five secondary bullet points here. Chapter 70 went up by $33,420 over our budgeted amount. We budgeted zero for charter school reimbursement, which was you know, that that was a controversial item and went back and forth in the General Assembly, got zeroed out, but then it came back. So we got $16,407 for charter school reimbursement. <clears throat> um, 
Unrestricted General Government Assistance, that's UGA. We saw an increase over our budgeted amount of $21,655. Here's the one that will attract the most attention. We had a very conservative estimate for pilot. Pilot has been more or less stagnant for years, so that's payment in lieu of taxes for state-owned property in the town of Douglas. But we're actually going to get 316,125. comma one two five. So that's an increase of $69,981. That's more than pilot has in increased for many, many years. So <clears throat> we had a small offset. We had school choice out, was budgeted at 347286 I mean, 344745 The actual was 347286 So the change reduces revenue by $2,541. Mm -hmm. So the net of all of these, provided I didn't fat thumb my uh, calculator, is an increase in the baseline revenues of $138,742. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> For a small town, that's not a bad way to come out of the budget season. Um, it would have been very difficult to raise that 138.47742, so we're, we're happy for it. Um, <clears throat> the only bad news here, um, the General Assembly, well, should I pull my punches or not? Well, I'll be nice. The General Assembly and the cannabis industry have arrived at an understanding. <laughs> <laughs> that mostly sides with the cannabis industry's view mm -hmm. that these impact fees that are being charged by municipalities are too high and shouldn't exist. That we should be forced to document the impact of these things coming into town. Yeah. <clears throat> now listen, they have also have the benefit of whatever, four, five, six years of experience having these things located. And at first there was this mad headlong rush, especially around retail establishments, and it was a major league pain in the backside for some of these communities that had early retail establishments with the traffic and the people going all over the place. A lot of that has really settled out. And so from my perspective, <clears throat> it would be the better part of my job every week to try to figure out, well, what did we do for such and such a business this week? You know, the sun came up and the moon came up and it rained a couple of times. It just doesn't... The things that we're doing for many of these businesses are totally indirect and can't be measured very easily. So the General Assembly basically said, yeah, you can't do that anymore, right? You can't charge this money anymore. <clears throat> so we're going to take it out of the budget going on a go-forward basis from this fiscal year. We will finish this year. We will. I mean, taking it out of the budget doesn't mean I'm not going to try to get some of that money in the door because it was an agreement that was signed by both the town and the business. They knew it, they could budget for it, and so it only goes so far. And our biggest payer of this in impact fee has in fact benefited tremendously from the activity of the town. So we ran public water by their building and connected them to it. We're running sewer by their building and now we're gonna run natural gas, alleviating the need for them to have truckloads of propane come every week. So yeah, you know what? Maybe I can't document penny by penny how much we're helping you, but we just increase the value of your building like ridiculously. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm not too afraid to try to collect that. Um, but on a go forward basis, it, it'll be zero in the budget. We're just not gonna ask for it. What I would remind people is it is not in this line. So it is not an impact fee. You will find it in the excise tax income for the town, but we, the town meeting in Douglas adopted the local excise on marijuana sales. So we've started getting those checks from the retail outlets in town. If we can complete the land transactions for the forest that are needed to get public drinking water supply well dug and the second cannabis facility opens up, it'll still be a fairly nice chunk of change uh, that comes into the town from the cannabis industry. It's just, it's an excise tax that we're piggybacked on the state to get. You think that will eventually be found unconstitutional, that excise tax? No, I think that, you know, the, the General Assembly can tax a vice yeah. as much as they want to, right? So you buy a bottle of booze, you pay an excise tax. You, you know, and almost anything you do is you pay at cigarettes. Um, so I don't know where they would come off thinking that's unconstitutional. So Matt, when all this settles, you think the cannabis industry and it becomes 
steady um, in the terms of the total income of all our income sources in the town will it be minor? you like you like me to ask the theoretical questions because you like to see the faces that Jean will make behind me <laughs> as I do my business consulting trick of coming up with 80 20 this, rule this stuff. will not be the salvation for towns all over the place over oh, no, I, I think <clears throat> we'll max out at two retail centers I think I'm well within my analytical druthers to say that they are about a two million dollar a year business each okay. one of them so three percent on the on the gross sales is about a hundred and twenty thousand a year okay Between two, when we've got two. once we have two yeah. okay. so by the power of mathematical deduction since we only have one <laughs> it could be half of 120. Could be. Yeah, it's fascinating how it works um, <laughs> Thank you for coming up with this, Matt, this summary. So then uh, the last thing I would talk about is um, we got a rate pass for our retiree health insurance so that we have so much stability in this account now, it's, it's nice because <clears throat> there's the rate pass, but then there's also a rate cap because we attracted Fall River to join the group, we now command a large number of covered souls as a group. So the provider, the carrier was happy with that result and had provided us with a contractual incentive to do that. So the rate cap extends out to 2025. So our per member per month premium will not exceed a $10 increase each year through 2025. So that's pretty extraordinary. Uh, we don't see that in the industry very much. I won't pull any punches here. Our group is the bridgehead for Aetna to, to sell this Medicare Advantage program into the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Nobody else has adopted it. So they see us as the primary vehicle to grow their market share. So they are providing these incentives to us. But we are, we are currently at 282.72 per member per month. When we were with Tufts, we were at 389. Mm -hmm. So we're $100 less per member per month. Who's the, <laughs> Matt, who's in the group? So the group is now seven. So we grew from three to seven. It's like naming my kids, right? Or make sure I don't forget any of them. <laughs> um, Douglas Webster, Dudley Charlton Schools, uh, the town of Medway, the town of Abington, the town of Franklin. Fall River. Fall River. Fall River. No, not Fall River. Oh. Oxford. Oh. I'm sorry, and Northbridge, so it's eight. We are now eight. Um, <clears throat> we have groups that have joined us for retiree benefits only, Fall River and Stoughton. So we have ten towns in the retirees and eight inactives and a lot of interest in what we're doing. I would think so. I'm part of the marketplace. Yeah. So, the big impetus this year was a company called Fallon exited the market. Exited. So, yep, they left, they left the health insurance, employer-based health insurance market in Massachusetts. They're still in Medicare. They're still in Medicare, in yeah. yeah. So that's just a minor note, but what that, so it's only a few thousand dollars, but over time, so Tufts wasn't only at 389, they were kind of locked into a 3% every year, and that's just gone away, so much more stable. That's what I have at the moment in terms of what we're looking at. We'll start doing planning in earnest really in the next couple of weeks. What I'm trying to arrive at is what is the total revenue growth going to be because I'm going to try to figure out how my compensation reform proposal will how much of that will be taken up by the new revenue. So I'm, I want to keep that to be a reasonable number so that we can still do some things that we need to do with the rest of the budget. So Matt, um, this is not related to this so much, but there's been talk for a while now of a new um, public uh, safety building, you know, combining highway and so on and so forth. These tend to be pretty expensive. Um, if we were to do something like that in our town, would it be primarily if we get enough grant money to pay for it? 
because there's really it'd be expensive for us to do it just on our own taxes, right? Is there a lot of is there state money available for these kinds of things? No, really. Okay. So, how can we get one without killing ourselves with taxes, or can't we? This is the the coin of the realm, right? The answer to this question, because I think we. We all understand that we have one building that we absolutely have to resolve. The highway department has yeah. to be resolved. So <clears throat> one could say that perhaps the town, because of its unique fiscal position under its current circumstances, should make the investment now so that 30 years from now you still have operable buildings. And you would have made the investment at the time when you had the most resources to deal with it. In other words, your down payment would be bigger now than it could be in the future. <clears throat> but another way to look at it is, you know, build what you need and you know, be reasonable about it. Look to future needs, and at the same time, don't over stretch because you don't have that kind of debt capacity to be able to do that. Um, <clears throat> When I look at statistics for municipalities across the Commonwealth, we have a very high debt ratio in Douglas. A lot of it goes back to you know building a couple of school buildings. So that constrains your activity, and what you need to do is build four corner buildings that are functional and downright aesthetic <laughs> in terms of their, you know, this is the no frill stuff. Right? That's aesthetic, it says, not aesthetic. aesthetic. Yeah. yeah. Town of Douglas on the outside, and make sure that it's a safe and comfortable place and efficient to light and to heat. But it doesn't need to be a 12 corner building with all kinds of gable ends and a cupola on top, like the police station that was just built in my town. And $9.3 million for a police building for a town. And if we built that building today, it would probably be more like 12 or 15 because the costs of things have gone up so much. That's not, I don't see, I wouldn't recommend to the town of Douglas that you do that. You know, just, but having said that, the responsible thing to do is to go to the design professionals of the world, not people who want to sell you their services to build a specific kind of building, because no matter what you do with the analysis, they're going to drive it towards that. Find somebody that you can trust, that you want to work with, that will weigh your options for you and get you the most cost-effective solution. Um, <clears throat> I think you'll have to borrow. It's a question of how much. And if can you keep the lid on it? Can there some combination of accrued free cash or other solutions, you know, lessen the pain to you? <clears throat> that's That's one thing. The second piece of it is, if we go out to bond, I think our rating will actually improve because we have addressed a number of the underlying financial conditions necessary for at least a one step increase or improvement in our bond rating. I don't think we meet the grade for AAA, but I think we can go from double, double A3 to double A2. Actually, I think we were there the last time. So when we refunded the high school bond, I think the town met the scorecard requirements for double A2. We just hadn't shown it over time, so we didn't have a long enough track record of fiscal stability at that level, but we do now. But will those savings, how many basis points will that save us versus what the market's going to do for the cost of borrowing? Yeah, our municipalities borrow at a low rate anyway. Some of the changes during the Trump administration kind of changed the dynamic of the bond market, so it has yet to be seen how well we'll do with it. But. So as we start working on the budget for next year, and that's coming up soon, will any part of that discussion be something toward a new highway building, as far as you know? Well, it really, has, it, it really has to be, and I think oh. I would invite Finance Committee members, if you haven't already, to view the video of the Building and Facilities Committee touring the Highway Department building and the Fire Department. It's an hour out of your time, but it might be the best use of your time, rather than having to go take the tour yourself. Because you can see how we have absolutely crammed, jammed, and stacked everything into this little tiny building. We have people working in there, 
who <laughs> can't move and can't really breathe clean air because that's why we put the trailer outside. Yeah. The air inside is not fit for a human workplace. It's not. Get people sick, which is way more expensive than dealing with the building issue. Yeah. So time is, it, the prudent thing to do would be to, to move things along. But it does take time. Public building projects take a long time. All right, any questions for Matt, anybody, on uh, anything he said or anything else on your mind at this point? Jean, anything for us at this stage in the game? Uh, just a question about who you would like present at your next meeting. So if you look at the schedule, everybody, on our agenda, so October 25, we're going to vote on our recommendations for the special town meeting, so we'll basically vote on the stuff we talked about tonight. Now, we're, who we have tentatively for... You had asked for water and sewer, yeah. 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 Uh, does anybody else have anybody specifically they'd like to come in and talk to us on the 25th? Or do you feel you have enough information to vote on them tomorrow night at this point? I think that's about it then. Okay, so you don't need Mappanoid back, Carol? You'll be all set with the I, I, I think we're all set. Okay. I think we're all set, okay. As far as you know, will everybody be here in two weeks? As far as you know. And then you'll note on our schedule too, uh, the night of the special town meeting, we're gonna meet at 6.30, that, whatever that room number is, I can't remember. At the high school. In the high school, just to wrap up some loose ends, so. Matt, you have anything else for us? And then on the 13th, Worcester Regional, did we get an okay from them, Gene? We did get an okay, okay. from them. All right, anybody have anything else that we need to talk about for tonight? Okay, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Lynn, did you make the motion? Seconded by Second. Mike Hutnack. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain, we adjourn at 8.23. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you.